Welcome, Bluthians, to another episode of True Fans of Dom Bluth on our YouTube channel. Uh, just like to start the video thanking everyone for the support on the previous two videos. Uh, they're both currently around about the 80 view mark, which I, you know, I see as a big win and incredible growth for the channel and the page and myself. So, thank you to everyone that uh, has watched the videos or listened to the podcast. Um, yeah, it means so much. You know, I don't care if it's eight views, eight hundred views, eight thousand views. Uh, it's just great to have people support the channel and su still supporting Don Bluth after all these years of him being in the business with Gary by his side, of course. Uh, now into our episode for today. Uh, I'm going in a chrono chronological order. Uh, the first one I did, The Secret of Nim, of course. And now we're up to An American Tale. Uh, now this is considered by a lot of fans as Don's best film, or one of. Uh, you'll find it's in most people's top three, uh, along with Nim and Land Before Time most of the time, with Anastasia as kind of the outside of the sometimes sneaks in and out. Uh, it's one of my um, personal favourites. Uh, it's not my favourite, we'll... Uh, We'll touch on my favourite very soon in, in the next episode. Uh, but with old Don Bluth movies, I, I absolutely love this one. So we'll get into the facts. Uh, this one I really like. Fievel was actually named after Steven Spielberg's grandfather. Um, oh, my mic just fell over there. That was great. I hope it wasn't too loud for you guys in the, in the headphones. And as you guys may know, I don't like editing because I like, like it real and raw. So you guys know that that's just the top person I am. <laughs> hope that wasn't... Too loud for you guys. That was a punch my microphone. Uh, so, yeah, back to the fact, guys. Uh, so, Don actually originally thought that the foreign name of Five would be too hard for kids to remember and wasn't really a catchy name. You know, it wasn't like a Mickey Mouse or or, or anything like that. Uh, obviously, they were going for their own twist. So they didn't want to be too close to Dizzy, but then also didn't want to didn't want to shy away from the fact that kids may not pick that up because you want a name to be a household name uh, but it was extremely personal to Steven uh, Spielberg who really really wanted it and it was the uh, Yiddish name of his grandfather Philip um, yeah Steven's uh, grandfather used to tell him stories about growing up in Russia and uh, how Jewish children were actually banned from schools in Russia and how hard it was uh, for him growing up so Steven really wanted to tell this story uh, and as a lot of filmmakers like to do, they make animated movies to kind of help tackle a, a serious subject, a bit like Secret of Nim as well, which tackles quite an uh, adult theme. But it's something that kids can handle in, in, a, in a certain way, if done right, which Don has done a great job throughout his career, and so has Stephen, actually. So, yeah, they he really wanted to tell his story, and as we know, Stephen's told some really uh, great historic stories over the years with obviously this and Schindler's List and uh, Saving Private Ryan, you know, those types of movies. You know, if it be a, a fictional movie like Saving Private, Saving Private Ryan, sorry, but also adding a bit of history as a backbone or, um, yeah, a story like this that is obviously based really heavily on his grandfather growing up and taking themes from that and kind of put a happier ending and a, a happier twist to get kids to watch it but also it's it's grown up enough so parents can enjoy it as well with their kids and really um understand the story and really uh oh, what's the word um familiarize with the characters as well know what they're going through so yeah this is a very important to Stephen um because it was so heavily based on his grandfather's childhood he he wanted this um the name of the mouse to be Fievel and hey it works I mean everyone knows when you say Fievel everyone straight away they know that you talk about an American tale so it's one of those things where you know you doubt it and you just you know you take someone's word for it like Don and Gary took Stephen's word for it and they went with it and it worked really really well um Fievel's another thing to do with Fievel's name. Fievel's nickname was actually inspired by the voice actor Philip Glasser at the time. He was seven and he's, um, he'd be dropped off to the studio 
by his grandmother and she would remind him to work on his lines every day, all that type of stuff that we all went through as kids when you, your parents, your grandparents drop him to school and say, don't forget this, don't forget that, make sure you do this, make sure you don't do this. Uh, his grandmother would say, hey, Philly, time to learn your lines <laughs> in a real strong Bronx accent. I'm not going to attempt to a Bronx accent because I just butcher it. But yeah, she'd say that and Bluth actually overheard it uh, one day and he actually loved it and he actually put it in the movie. So I think... The, the name of the mouse that gives him the nickname Philly is uh, Tony, I think, I believe. Um, yeah, I always wanted to know how old the voice actor uh, was of Fievel because a lot of times they'll get adult voice actors that are obviously experienced voice actors to do um, kid characters because they can obviously work a lot more hours and they know how how the movie business works, but as Don proved throughout his career that he liked using kids, he, he knows that it, there's a difference that sometimes audiences can't be fooled by adults, you know, a 30 year old trying to voice act a 10 year old character. Sometimes those work, sometimes it does. Um, but yeah, I've, that's something that I think all fans appreciate about Don is he knows what works, what doesn't, and he definitely knows that kids voicing kids is a big yes. So, big up Don. Uh, Henry the Pigeon was originally a, hit, a scruffy bird named Bobo. Uh, in the early storyboards, um, yeah, the character was meant to look a bit scraggly and, and real rough. Uh, but it, it all changed when Christopher Plummer was cast. And they didn't really think his voice kind of fit the character. but they, And they really, really wanted Christopher Plummer to voice. So, they kind of rearranged the character and polished him up and yeah completely different character and Christopher Plummer is an amazing actor and also an amazing voice actor he's done some great voice work over the years and this is one of his best for sure even though it's not a, a very big character definitely Henry does leave a big big impression on fans uh, now this is one of the I guess most serious things coming out of this movie was Steven Spielberg was actually accused of plagiarism. Um, now, as a, as a comic book fan, I have actually heard of this story. There was a graphic novel series called Mouse, M-A-U-S, and it was a story pretty much that Jewish people were the mice and the Germans were the cats. And obviously, this was solely uh, aimed at adults, so this wasn't like an American Tale or, or Secret of Nim trying to do both 50-50. This was solely um, pretty much based to probably middle teenage to adult. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't too full-on, but it was full-on for, obviously, young kids. Um, yeah, so I think Art Spiegelman, I think I pronounced his name, he was the author of Mouse, and he believed that Bluth and Spielberg had actually stolen the idea and turned it into American Tale. Uh, he didn't actually sue, though. He kind of, I guess, did a smart thing. He rushed the release of his book, to just come out before an American Tale come out to prove that he wasn't the plagiarist, but then also, I guess, to capitalise on an American Tale, knowing that that was going to be a big move because of Spielberg and because of the comparison between the two, he would hope that people would then look at his product as a comparison to an American Tale, that people love that, but also love Mouse. So, can't find a lot of information to see if this was even settled in court or out of court, or that's what Art just did. He just wanted to prove he wasn't the plagiarist. He, he didn't really care about the money side. He just didn't want people in the community or fans to think that he was a plagiarist. Um, yeah. And this is just a, a fun little cool little fact. Um, something that I think happened around 14, 15 years after American Tale was released. Uh, Five was announced as a um, spokes... Well, I should say spokes mouse for UNICEF in 2000. Uh... Yeah, and I think the tagline was what I can find here is his immigration experiences reflect the adventures and triumphs of all cultures and their children, which is great. I think that was a perfect pick for that, and I think we all can uh, really appreciate that on that little little uh, bite-sized fact there. And another big thing when you look at the the repercussions, for lack of a better word, that this movie had... Uh, was that DreamWorks probably may not have existed without this or the Land Before Time. So, 
Steven at, at, at that time hadn't actually dipped into animation a lot, but he'd really thought about it and really wanted to because he thought it was a great way to tell stories. And he saw The Secret of Nim and absolutely loved it, loved the animation, loved the story. Um, so he contacted Don and Gary and wanted to do a movie. So that's why they... It was a joint um, production, American Tale was, between Sullivan Bluth Studios and Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. Um, yeah, so the success of this in Land Before Time, Stephen actually went and opened up an animation branch of his business called Amblimation. Um, yeah, so they, they did that. They made a couple of movies, and then him and a few others, I think Jeffrey Katzenberg was in there, they actually formed DreamWorks together. And Amblimation pretty much absolved into that, and a lot of the employees were brought over from Amblimation to DreamWorks as kind of the head honchos. And the first movie they tackled was actually the uh, Prince of Egypt, which isn't one of my favourite uh, DreamWorks movies, but it is a very great movie. The animation is actually really, really good, and it's a really good story to tell. And this fact I really, really love. So this may surprise a few people. So I'm an avid fan of animation, and obviously specifically Don Bluth, but I'm also an avid horror fan. I absolutely love horror. On my other gaming channel, I play a lot of uh, horror gaming sorry horror games uh so yeah if you have time check it out if you don't i'm not going to push it that's fine um but yeah i love both and it's quite funny when you tell people that oh yeah you know one of my favorite movies is old always get a heaven oh one of my one of my favorite movies is scream so it is it goes down quite funny when people hear that and how people hear how much a big fan of don bluth i am and i tell them all the uh horror people i'm fans of like tom savani and stuff but this fact is actually really interesting so before he was a writer, David Kirshner uh, was actually a doll designer. Um, and then he did doll design after an American Tale. And he actually designed another character, which was actually Chucky from Child's Play. We all know Chucky. I think even if you're not a fan of horror movies or never seen the movie Child's Play, I think everyone knows who Chucky is and what he is. So I kind of find it funny that... Although Dave didn't actually create any of the characters in an American Tale, he wrote it. I still think it's funny that you compare his work on that to his work as designing the doll of Chucky, which both both works are absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is another one that I was actually quite surprised to hear. Uh, and now, as we all know, even me and an Australian, I know who Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert were. And obviously a lot of Americans will know who they are. They actually gave this movie an American Tale two thumbs down with Ebert saying this is the most downbeat movie since Return to Oz which began you may remember with Dorothy being strapped down for electro th electroshock therapy sorry uh, and it, yeah a lot of uh, critics agreed actually which is very very surprising now reading back but the public so the general audience really really liked it and it made 47 million domestically and that's just domestically I think it made well over 100 million international, which is fantastic for a non Disney animated movie in the 80s. I cannot begin to tell you how great that was. And actually went toe to toe with Disney's Great Mouse Detective. And it absolutely demolished it in the box office. They released a couple of months apart, and they even crossed over at some period in a few countries. And yeah, it wasn't even a comparison with uh, the money that they made or also the movie itself. I, I, I really like The Great Mouse Detective, don't get me wrong. I It's probably the second best 80s Disney movie behind Black Cauldron. I actually really like The Black Cauldron, but that's a conversation for a different time. But yeah, no comparison between the two, and it was such a big win for Don Bluth and his company. Such a big win. And obviously with the help with Spielberg behind him, with obviously the budget and the marketing and stuff, really helped them get this amazing story amazing film out to the public uh so it would have been such a great feat for don to not only make a great movie again after the success of secret of nimit critically but also to be able to make so much money from it as well which they failed to do with the secret of nimit mainly marketing wise because they just didn't have the money behind it but like i said with the help marketing wise of spielberg and his studio they got it and they were able to tell the story and also make money from it which obviously led to them making a lot more movies down the track. Now, this one surprises me as well. And a lot of people, there's three things that people think about when they talk about American Tale. They obviously think about Fievel, 
They obviously think about a certain character, which I'll, <laughs> I'll touch on very soon. And the third is actually the song Somewhere Out There. For, we all know, we all, we all try to sing it, but we all probably butcher it, especially me. I'm, a, I'm not a singer, that's for sure. I could barely talk. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so the writers were uh, Cynthia Wheel and uh, Barry Mann. They were only given four weeks to write four different songs for the movie, which is absolutely mind-boggling when you think how long it takes to make one song. But you have a movie coming saying to two people, here, we want four songs, but we've only got four weeks, they have to be finished, but we're giving you James Horner. <laughs> so, I mean, it was kind of a win-win uh, for both sides. Um, yeah, they, they, the three of them, James, Barry, and Cynthia weren't really sold on the song. Um, they thought it was a bit rushed. Uh, they were obviously, they were happy with it. Um, they were, you know, they would never have obviously uh, given them the song they thought it wasn't great, but they didn't think it was going to be a hit. But uh, Spielberg was the one that actually listened to it and he said, no, no, this is going to be a top 40 hit, I guarantee you. And he was right. He was actually more than right. The song actually peaked at number two, which is absolutely phenomenal when you think 80s is regarded as probably the best decade of for music. So for this song in 1986 to be hit number two is just incredible feat and actually won two Grammy Awards. And it was nominated for an Oscar but lost to Take My Breath Away from Top Gun. If this was any other year, any other year in the 80s or even the 90s for that category, this song would have won. But because it came up against arguably one of the greatest movie songs of all time, especially in the 80s, Take My Breath Away from Top Gun, Somewhere out there would have won the Oscar, but unfortunately it didn't. And I would have absolutely loved for an early Don Bluth move to win an Academy Award. It would have been absolutely phenomenal. Sorry, And obviously back when Don Bluth was in his magic times, they didn't have a best animated feature film category. That wasn't actually brought into way down the track. I think 2001 was the first year. And we, you look back and you think that the movies that these movies come up against... Don Bluth actually probably would have been a triple Academy Award winner with The Secret of Nim, The Land Before Time, and American Tale. He would have minimum, 100% minimum, with the movies that they would have come up against. Obviously, with all different companies out there now, compared to what there was in the 80s, of course, it's not really a comparison, but you think back and you're thinking, damn, like, I really feel for Don and Gary, they could have been triple Academy Award. Even, you know, even... Anastasia might have been a you know a little flicker of a hope to win. I can't recall which Disney movie if a Disney movie came. No, I don't think Disney released a movie that year. They released Hunchback of Notre Dame in '96, and I think Milan was '98. So I think Anastasia probably could have won. So when you think they could have been quadruple Academy Award winners, which and you know, and you also factor in some songs that probably should have won like this. You know, not saying it should have won because I I think that Take a Breath Away deserved the award. But, um, yeah, it's a shame when you think about how many Academy Awards that Don and Gary could have won. So, on to the, uh, I think the last, I don't mind keeping track of the fact, guys, but I think this might be the last one. Now, the the, the screenwriters, actually, a lot of them um, were actually Sesame Street writers, but not all of them were writers. Some of them were um, stagehands and whatnot. And that's why a lot of uh, critics and a lot of fans say why an American Tale resonates with children so well, but also resonates with adults, because the writers were able to take the things from Sesame Street, so the real basic things they know that kids are going to love, they're going to enjoy, and they're also going to react to, and they're going to be able to share with the characters. They took that, and they put it in the movie, but then they also took, took the things that adults also resonate with as well. So I think perfect choice for the screenwriters for this movie, I don't think you could have picked better screenwriters because, yeah, the things I just touched on, a lot of movies don't do that. And The Secret of Nim and this one really both do. They really, really do. Um, I think Judy was one of the... Uh, Judy Frudberg, I think her name is pronounced. She was a um, wrote the screenplay for the movie. She actually was on Sesame Street for, I think, f- between 30 to 40 years. And she, I think she joined joined the production only as like uh, an assistant in the music department or in the music department at some period. And she actually ended up being a writer. It's so interesting seeing people's travels 
in a movie, in just a single movie production, where they started, when they actually ended, because it's it happens all the time. It's great, you know. It just proves if you if you work hard and you have a lot of talent and you believe in yourself, you will get there in the end. So that's an incredible story. Now, like I said it earlier, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on a character. It's not really an interesting fact or anything like that, but I know that there's a lot of characters that people love from Don Bluth movies and movies in general. Um, so, I, you know, I honestly think that this may be one of the most recognisable animated characters ever. Now, I'm going to give you... Oh, I'm going to give you, what, five seconds? Five seconds to try and realise what I'm talking about. Alright, that's enough time. I'll talk, I'll talk about Dom DeLuise as Tiger. Now, this isn't an interesting fact or anything. I just want to touch on it because this is one of the greatest uh, voice performances you'll ever hear or see. I just can't even begin to touch on how Dom DeLuise was able to portray his character with his voice, but then also with the help of the amazing animators and how they met in the middle to create such a great character. Now, I honestly put Tiger up there with Robin Williams, the genie from Aladdin, as probably two of the greatest comedic relief animated characters that have ever existed. Like, it, you rewatch watch this movie in American Tale, and you solely focus on Tiger, okay, and then you re-watch it and just, just watch, the, or even vice versa, watch the movie normally, and then second time around, focus on Tiger, he makes the same impact, even if you try not to, to look at him, or be drawn into his character so much, you, you, you can't, like, you can not, not, <laughs> I can't speak English, <laughs> like, you can't not like this character, like, the character development, the jokes, um, the balance between comedic, dramatic, it's just great. And I, I didn't want to do a, a YouTube video or a podcast on American Tale and not touch on Tiger and the late, great Dom DeLuise, who was such a great person and such a amazing talent. And everyone talks about how, how much I loved working with Dom. Um, I would have absolutely loved to have met, met him and... You know, times were different, and I was doing this, you know, 10 years ago, or even longer than 10 years ago, I think he passed away in 09, but I'd love to have interviewed Dom, even if it was five minutes, it probably would have been the most entertaining and invigorating interview you'd ever do, so, um, yeah, I just want to touch on that, uh, yeah, like I said, I couldn't do a, uh, I couldn't do a podcast or a YouTube video without touching on, on Dom's Tiger, that's for sure, uh, so, yeah, thanks guys, thanks for listening, uh, if you know the, the chronological order of the Don Bluth movies, you know which one's going to be next. Um, I'm hoping to get that one released next week or the week after. I am actually going on my honeymoon uh, in a couple of weeks. And I'll be gone for about three weeks. So um, I'm trying to produce as many videos and podcasts as I can. And I'm going to actually schedule them to release while I'm away. So yeah, there will be videos and there will be podcasts ready to go. Uh, so you guys don't have to miss out, don't have to wait, uh, it'd be good to go, um, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to rushing back here and doing more video, video sorry, for you guys, um, it's been great, I love it, uh, please continue to support the page and the YouTube channel, uh, make sure you click that, that like button when you do watch it, um, it only takes a second, but it makes such a difference to me and the growing of the channel, I uh, appreciate it, and yeah, like I always say, Please message the page, comment on the YouTube video, comment on anything on the Instagram post, whatever. If you have any tips or hints or anything for me to make better videos or if you want me to focus on a video, I'm not just going to be doing each Don Bluth movie. I will be doing other things as well. So please, if you want me to touch on something, please let me know. Uh, thank you so much, Bluthians, for watching. I'll catch you later. Thank you very, very much.